Good morning. Um, I want to first start off by thanking the church for uh, giving me this opportunity, uh, Brother Andy, and uh, also for all the prayers. I uh, thanks for the uh, men's Sunday school room uh, praying for me this morning. I appreciate that. Um, the passage we're going to be in is John. We're going to be in John chapter 1. And it's uh, verses 1 through 18. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a long passage, but we're going to try to cover most of it uh, this morning. And to start off with, I'm going to say a word of prayer. Father God, we come to you this day. Um, we thank you uh, for this opportunity to worship you. We are here for you. We are here to worship your son. We are here to worship you, God. I ask that you would please be with us, open up our hearts, God. Let us hear from your word, and uh, let us apply it to our lives in such a way that our lives are filled with just the worship of you. Thank you for everybody in this room, God. Give, give me the words to say, Lord. Be here this morning with us. It's in the name of Christ I pray. Amen. All right. So, I'm going to... Uh, we're going to read the whole passage first, and then we're going to, we're going to break it down from there. So, um, you know what, if you would please stand as I read the passage. Starting in verse 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him, and apart from Him not one thing was created that has been created. Life was in Him, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man named John who was sent from God. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The true light who gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was created through him, yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born, not of blood, or the will of the flesh, or the will of man, but God. The word became flesh and took up residence among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him and exclaimed, This was the one of whom I said, the one coming after me has surpassed me because he, is, he existed before me. Indeed, we have all received grace after grace from his fullness. For although the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the one and only Son, the one who is at the Father's side. He has revealed him. You can be seated. All right. So, starting in verse 1, we're going to go verse 1 through 3 first, okay? And it says, in the beginning was the Word, okay? And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, okay? What is this Word? It's capitalized, okay? It's Christ. Christ was there in the beginning. So let's read it like that. It says, in the beginning was the Christ, and the Christ was with God, and the Christ was God. Verse 2, he was with God in the beginning, and all things were created through him. And apart from him, not one thing was created. So, if we look at Genesis, Genesis 1, 1 says what? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? And then right here it says, in the beginning, okay? So, we see those two things parallel one another. That Christ is there in the beginning. In Genesis, in the beginning, he was there as the word of God, okay? He was there, and he was also there, and all things were created through him, okay? So God created all things through Christ. All things were created through him, apart from him, and apart from him not one thing was created that has been created. So we know that John, okay, the Apostle John, he's writing and he's saying that Christ was there in the beginning and Christ is God, okay? We see that in verses 1 through 3, that Christ is God, the one that all things were created through. So, now that we, we've set that as a foundation, we know that, and we know that as Christians, 
But let's look at verses 4 through uh, four and 5. It says, life was in him, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness did not overcome it. Okay? So, life was in Christ. Life was in Christ in the beginning. As it was created through him, that life, men, was, men were created, right? And they were created through Christ, and that life that they had was in him, in Christ. Okay? It was the light of men. So, in the beginning was Christ. God created man, right? So, we know this from Genesis. Uh, he created all things. He created man, it's, man itself, and he, it says that it was created through Christ, the Word. All right? Now, why is it significant that life was in him? Why is it that significant? And John here takes a kind of a turn for a second, and he's kind of introducing uh, through, the, through the rest of his writing. You know, he talks about Christ the whole time, but he's introducing Christ here. And he focuses that on verses 1 through 5, but now he takes a short turn, and he turns to, uh, at verse 6, and he says, there was a man named John. So the focus goes from Christ for a second, and it turns to this guy named John, right? John the Baptist, okay? The one who was supposed to come before Christ to tell about him. And that's what we're going to talk, read about real quick. It says, there was a man named John who was sent from God, okay? He came as a witness to testify about the light. He came as a witness to testify about the light. So that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light, the true light who gives life to everyone who is coming into the world. Okay. So John, God sent John. Okay. He sent him to testify about the light. And specifically, that this light was the light of men, which, which all life was created through. Life itself. He's testifying that God is coming. He's being the witness before Christ comes that the God who created you is coming to earth. Okay? That's what John is testifying about. He's the witness. He's witnessing that God in the flesh is going to walk among his people. Okay? And he's telling them that the life, that our life was in him, that he created us. Okay? And when we talk about this, we, have, we also have to realize that he's talking to the people at the time, but it's for us today too. But John's mission was to testify to the people at the time that God was coming, and it was the God who gave them life, who breathed life into them. Okay? So, with that said, looking at verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was created through him, Christ. Yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. And then verse 12 and 13 says, But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, or the will of the flesh, or the will of man, but of God. So let's stop right there. He was in the world. Okay, so John the Baptist comes. He, wit he comes before Christ, witnesses about him, and now... God shows up. Christ shows up. He, he says he was in the world. So what John the Baptist said was going to happen, happens. He made the way for him, right? Now he's in the world. So what happens when the creator of the world, of the creator of his, of his own creation, what happens when he shows up? When he shows up and walks among the things that he created and his own people, it says that they did not recognize him and they did not receive him. And looking back, again, uh, Genesis plays a big part in this. But looking back at Genesis, we know that God created man, put Adam and Eve in the garden. And then he walks with Adam and Eve in a perfect relationship in the garden, right? And there's no sin there, so their relationship is perfect. And then Adam and Eve sin. So what happened in verse 10... Why does the ones he created not recognize him and reject him or not receive him? It's because of the sin in the garden. It's because they have a sinful nature. So the one that they walked with, so the one that men walk with in the garden and have this perfect relationship with, now that he's came to earth to walk with them again, 
to walk with him again. They don't even recognize him. They, they don't even receive him. They have no idea who he is. It's how far that man has come. They, from the point of the, from the garden of the fall of man up until this point, that's how far man has come. They don't even recognize him. Not even his own people. The people that he sets aside throughout the Old Testament. His own people don't even recognize him. He comes to them. The ones that know the word. And they didn't receive him as who he was. They didn't receive him as the word of God, the one there in the beginning. They didn't receive him as the Christ, the Messiah. All right? So, they didn't receive him, and they didn't recognize him. That's what sin does in our lives, right? We have a sinful nature, therefore, we do not recognize the truth that Christ is the Son of God. We do not recognize the truth. And we don't receive that truth either. We don't receive that as truth. Because our nature says we are bent against the one who created us. We are disobedient and we have rejected him. But there is, uh, there is hope, and John tells us about this in verse 12, okay? John tells us about this and he says, but to all who did receive him. Okay, so we have two groups of people. We have the people that do, do not receive him, and we have the people who do receive him. But he says, to all who did receive him. What, is he, what does he do to the ones who receive him? The ones who did recognize him as the Son of God. The, the ones who did recognize that he was the one from the beginning. What does he do to those? He says, he gave them the right to be children of God. You received him, you've been given the right to be a child of him. God the Father. To those who believe in his name. Okay, so how do you become a child? And how do you receive him? You believe on his name. So how do you believe on his name? You have to be born. Not of blood or the will of the flesh or the will of man, but you have to be born of God. Right? To be a child of God, you have to be born of God. Verse 13 says, who were born? Not of blood. Okay? And right there, the not of blood means not of a lineage. Not from who you were born after. It's not by uh, your grandparents or specifically talking about maybe Israel there. And not where God has set you aside and you're part of this lineage. You're not a child by that. And you're not a child by the will of the flesh. Not a natural birth. Nor the will of man. So your own self-righteous works will not make you a child of God. But to those who believe on his name. That is how you were made of a child of God. That is how you were born of God. You receive him by believing on his name, and that is, and then once you do that, you're given the right to be a child of God. So that relationship that we talked about earlier, or just a second ago, about God's relationship with man being perfect, that has now been restored. But how has that been restored? How has that relationship been restored? It goes back to the word, Christ himself. It goes back to Christ himself. Verse 14 says, The word became flesh and took up residence among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay? Verse 15, John the Baptist testified concerning him and exclaimed, this was the one of whom I said, the one coming after me has surpassed me because he existed before me. All right, so the word becomes flesh. He shows up in the flesh. He comes and puts on flesh. He comes and lives like we live. He took up residence among us. That means he lives with us. He lived with us. And it says we observed his glory. John writes, we observed his glory. But there are many people that we know, there are many people, almost everybody, did not know it was God's glory that they were seeing. We observe his glory. The glory as the one and only Son from the Father. So God sent his Son, Christ, wrapped in flesh to live among us. And then it says that John the Baptist testified, okay, testified that this was God. And he told us... He, he told men this. 
He told men that God was going to wrap himself in flesh and come to earth. But what, is, what, does he do? what happens after that? Since he's come and he lives among us, what, what do we believe in that, that sets us apart from the ones who do not receive him? What do we believe in? We believe in his finished work, believing in his name, believing that he is our only salvation. So verse 16, Indeed, we have all received grace after grace from his fullness. Not by nothing we can do, verse 17, for although the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Okay? So it's nothing that we do. It's not the works of the law. But it says, we have received grace after grace. From what? His fullness. From what? From his accomplished work. From what he is. From who he is. It is by him we are saved and no other. Him alone. His work that he came in the flesh, as it says, he came in the flesh and lived perfectly, right? As God in the flesh. So, we'll finish up with verse 18, and then we're going to look at a couple other things. It says, verse 18 says, No one has ever seen God. No one has ever seen God. The one and only Son, the one who is at the Father's side, Christ. Christ has revealed Him. Christ is the one who revealed the Father. We did not recognize him, but Christ came. We didn't receive him, but he still went to the cross. For the ones that he created, for the ones he created that rejected him, he died for. He died for all of us. We know this. So the question then becomes, since we understand that Christ has come, as the Son of God. And we know what He's done, that He died on the cross and took your sin upon Him. Took your sin upon Him. And then rose from the dead to give you life. Right? The life that was found, him, found in Him in the beginning. You can now be restored to the life that was in Him. You can have life, right? We're dead in our trespasses and sins. We are dead because we reject Him, because we are sinful. We, we reject Him because we are sinful, but He can give us life again. And we get that life through Him coming to earth. We get that life through Him coming to earth and living perfectly, and then dying and, and, being, rose, and being risen by the Father again. And believing in that is believing in his name. Believing that he is the Christ. Um, I, I did a, a short uh, message uh, Friday morning for uh, FCA at Plus Lauderdale. And I kind of I talked about this a little bit. It wasn't all of it, just a couple verses. And the question I left, I left them with was, is it a big deal? Is... Is this, these 18 verses, is that a big deal to us? We just, we just read them. We know what they say. Does that mean anything to us? And for the Christian, it should mean everything. It means everything. We do not have life without God. We do not have physical life without God. He's the one who gives us life. He's also the one who gives us spiritual life. All of creation was created, what, through Christ, right? All creation was created through Christ. And that creation rejects him and does not receive him when he comes to live among them, among us. But then, through his work on the cross, through his perfect life that he lived, through who, who he is, he also, through him, we are recreated. We are recreated through Christ. He changes us. He does the work in our lives. 
He does all of these things just to save his people. He does all of these things to save people. Why? Why does he do this? Well, are we worth saving? No. Understand that you're not worth saving. The only reason you're worth anything is that God gives you worth. The only reason you're sitting where you are is because God has created you. And he's created you to worship him. And that is your worth. That is what you are worthy of, is just worshiping him. But we have to understand that that is the greatest calling put on anyone. Why? Because the one we are worshiping is worthy of everything. He is, but it says that we saw his glory. He is glorious. He is worth our worship. He is, his character is perfect. He is perfect. He is completely good. So he's completely worth everything. And we are called to worship him. We are called to surrender all to him. We are called to believe in his name. Not to believe in our own self-righteous works. Not to try. But to rest in Christ. To rest and to walk daily. Remember, God comes and walks with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening. We are called to that same walk now with the Spirit through Christ, recreated in Him for the glory of His name. For the glory of His name and His name alone, not our own. But He also does this out of love. First, love for the Father. Christ is completely obedient to the Father. The reason Christ goes to the cross is, yes, to forgive us for our sins, but it's because God called him to do that. That was the command. That, that was what his call to obedience was, was to die for God's people, to die for the world. And secondly, it was for his love for us. That he, it says, what, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that Christ came. So he loves you. He's the one who gives you worth. And once he gives you that, all we can do in, in response is to fall down and worship him because we are completely unworthy and totally depraved in our sinful state. We are dead. We are dead. And in him, that is, all, that is where life is found. Only in him is where life is found. So, how do we respond? How are we going to respond to these verses? How are we going to respond? For the Christians in this room, for the Christians in this room, you respond the same way John the Baptist responds about knowing the truth. Since you know the truth, you respond the same way. You testify about the one who is coming. You witness to the one who is coming. Christ says what? I'm coming back, right? He's coming back. He's going to return. And we are left here to proclaim that, to pave the way, to make the way for the coming king. And this time he will come with judgment. And we are to tell people that. We are to tell that he lived before us. He created us, and yet he died for us. He rose again and gave us new life. We tell people this. We are supposed to be paving the way. Letting people know that he's coming again and that you can find salvation in him. You can find salvation from the judgment, from the wrath that is to come in Christ and only in Christ. God's wrath is coming and the only way you're going to find relief from it or salvation from it is in Christ. It's the only way. And for the people in the room who do not know Christ, who have not received him, who rejected him, there is a call to repent and believe. There is a call to repent and believe in Christ.
to recognize him as God, to recognize him as the one who was sent, who is completely worthy of our worship. Repent and believe in him. Repent and believe in him. What does it mean to repent and believe? Turn from your sins, but turn from who you are. You are a sinner. Turn from who you are. Do not look at yourself anymore. Do not look at what you can do. Turn from that and turn to Christ and stare at Jesus because he's the only one worthy looking at. We are filthy rags, but he is worth everything. He is completely beautiful and majestic, right? We see that. He is glorious. But I say that, and they could just be words that a lot of people are hearing, that he's glorious. And people have a lot of different definitions of what glorious means. But the reason we have a lot of different definitions of what glorious or what glory is or what glorious means is because we are sinners and we desire things that are sinful. We desire things and we worship things that are sinful. And we think that the world's definition of glory is what we should compare God to. Absolutely not. He is completely glorious by himself, and the reason we can't compare anything to him is because there's nothing to compare to him. There's nothing. Nothing. So come to Christ. Receive him and recognize him as the one who came. Receive him and recognize him as the one who came. Surrendering all to him, believing that you cannot do it, knowing that, and believing in his finished work, believing that he is the one to come. The word became flesh. Remind your, it's a, da a daily task to remind yourself that Christ came. Daily worshiping of him, that is what we are called to do. Daily, everything from the point that when you become saved, everything after that, Everything is just complete worship of Christ. No, yes, there are failures, and yes, we still sin. But our desire is no longer to idolize ourselves and to worship ourselves, but to worship Jesus as the one who revealed God. So, as um, Brother Kerry and Smelly Comfort. Remember, there's two, two ways of response. Two ways. As a Christian, you were called, you were called to respond in a way that which, once you leave this place, that now that you understand that you will proclaim his name, that is what you are to do in obedience, is to proclaim his name. And to the others, you come and repent and believe. Because you're dead. And God wrath remains on you. And the only way, the only salvation is Christ. That's the only way you're getting out. But understand this. You might think it's not worth it coming to Christ, repenting and believing. You might not think it's not worth it. But understand this. For those who do receive him, they know that it is completely worth it to follow Christ. They know that it's completely worth it. It will be completely worth it. Because life is in him. He has given it to us. So come and repent. Our hymn of invitation this morning, our hymn of invitation is hymn number 437. Take up thy cross and